Good morning, Dr. Oban Jesse. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. My um, name is Lawana Brown. I'm the um, program director for the online uh, women's health nurse practitioner track at Regis College. So it's okay. a great pleasure to talk to you this morning. We just um, we put about 600 nurses out into the workforce every year. Our president is a nurse, so we really have a vested interest in healthcare. And for me, women's health is uh, a major area for me. Uh, ever since I've been a nurse for 15 years, in the last eight as a nurse practitioner. All of my work has been in women's health. So this is a conversation I'm looking forward to for personal reasons as well. So I'd like to first just um, find out a little bit about you and about what brought you to medicine in general, to your area of practice. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So I am originally from Indiana. Uh, I went to uh, Indiana University for my undergraduate uh, training. Uh, I was a biology major then, so I knew I wanted to become a doctor. Um, after I finished my uh, undergraduate training at in Indiana, I participated in a program called the NIH Academy, which is the National Institutes of Health Academy. It's a one-year post-baccalaureate program where uh, individuals who have an interest in healthcare, so either becoming physicians or some other aspect of the health uh, system, spend a year doing research in the National Cancer Institute, and also they have courses on health disparities. And that experience is very transformative for me. Um, I spent my time at the National Cancer Institute uh, working with Dr. Jeffrey Rubin. At the time, my research involved the purification of Wnt genes, so it was a basic science lab. Um, and so that, that was a very um, a fantastic experience. Uh, but also what was very unique about that program was that they had these lectures on health disparities. And at that time, I wasn't really familiar with the concept of health disparities. I didn't really know the language about health disparities. And I also didn't know you could do research on health disparities. So that experience was, was very transformative for me in that I learned about you know, how there are differences in terms of outcomes amongst people, um, differences in access to healthcare, and how that has significant implications for certain parts of the population. So that was the experience that uh, confirmed my um, idea of going into medicine, but then also helped uh, shape me as a clinician in terms of how I viewed my experience as a medical student, resident, and then also as a fellow and finally as an attending. Wow, that is wonderful. It's nice to know that programs like that can give you that focus that you need. All of us going into medicine uh, go in and don't really know sometimes which way we're going to go. And there's usually something significant that happens that kind of turns that corner for us. So it's wonderful to know that. What was it in particular that drew you to oncology? You know, that's an area of medicine that might be scary even for healthcare professionals because of what you're dealing with in the, with cancer. But can you speak a little bit about what drew you to that particular practice area? So I was drawn to oncology because of the multi-dimensional and multidisciplinary aspects of it. Uh, as somebody who has an interest in health disparities, there were multiple avenues across the cancer continuum to intervene to improve outcomes. Um, I also enjoyed sort of the interpersonal relationship with patients. You know, cancer is a very personal and it's also a very scary thing. And so being able to sort of help guide people through this experience uh, in terms of their surgical decision making and all their sort of clinical decision making was something that really drew me to this field. So mostly it was because an interest in disparities, but also the relationships that you get to develop with the patients. And that's interesting because um, patient relationships, you know, they're very different depending on the area of practice you, that you're in. Sometimes you may have a more casual relationship, but what you're talking about is more of an intimate kind of relationship as you're guiding them through a very difficult process, a difficult time in their life. So I imagine that is a very special, specialized area for more than one reason. Uh, you have a lot of, uh, I, I, in looking, I saw that you have so many different articles with so much information that you've published that um, really are very interesting and insightful. One of the things that I noticed that you uh, wrote about uh, and you made a statement um, stating that your research is focused on examining how social determinants of health and financial toxicity affect clinical outcomes. Financial toxicity, that was a new um, packaging for me, but I just really embraced that. And I wanted to hear from you how you've been able to see that play out in uh, the ways that you've dealt with patients particularly. So I think a lot of time in cancer, when we talk about treatment side effects, we focus on the side effects of chemotherapy, we focus on the side effects of surgery, and we also focus on the side effects of radiation therapy. But what we're not very good at is focusing on the cost and the implications of the cost on patients. And so, you know, we live in a society where resources are not evenly allocated, and so some people are more resource rich than others. And so 
getting a cancer diagnosis can be very costly. And depending on your resources, it can have significant implications for your day-to-day -day living. So, you know, people may have to make decisions about, you know, work, about paying their bills, about childcare. And all of these are very complex decisions that involve finances that can have significant implications for people's medical decision making. And so there's a huge movement right now in the field of oncology to really try to understand how do the treatments that we give patients, how does that affect them financially? And not just sort of broadly financially, but within three domains, you know, how does it affect their material resources? So their actual bottom line, you know, um, their, their wealth, their, their finances, uh, how does it also affect them psychologically? So, you know, having a cancer diagnosis in and of itself is stressful to then have the cost of the cancer superimposed on that adds an additional level of stress. And then also how do people cope with this? So sometimes when people have to make difficult decisions in terms of their health versus their day-to-day -day living, they may make choices that may not necessarily optimize their clinical outcomes, but honestly are the best choice for them at that time. Um, there's a book, uh, Little Fires Everywhere, where one of the, um, the main characters makes a comment that, you know, life is a series of choices and some people have good choices to choose from and some people sometimes don't have great choices and they make the best choice based on what they have. And I think in oncology, that's a very sort of uh, relatable um, point where, you know, sometimes people may make choices about their treatment based on their resources. And to those of us who are not involved in their personal finances, we may not understand why they made those choices, but actually of all the choices they had, that was the best one for them. So we're really trying to move away from sort of prescribing treatments, looking at just the treatment side effects and trying to understand more holistically how the treatments that we impart onto our patients, how that has implications for them in other avenues of their life. That is so well stated. And that is something that we obviously see across, you know, the medical field that sometimes we have to meet the patients where they are so that they can kind of have the best outcome for them in their circumstance. So that is so, I, I'm really glad to know that that is something that's being looked at even in the area of practice that you have. One thing that's obvious um, to all of us in medicine, and I know especially probably to you, is there is a different experience for someone that gets a diagnosis of cancer or any type of medical diagnosis and that may be white versus someone that's a person of color. So beyond the challenges that a cancer diagnosis would face, you know, that any cancer patient would face, and we know those can be very great, um, you know, challenges, what issues could you see that would be unique to patients of color or have you seen in your practice? So unfortunately, Black women face a lot of barriers uh, across the cancer continuum. So from, you know, understanding the etiology of cancers in uh, Black women to the survivorship phase after people have finished their treatment. And, you know, that area of, of um, this, this is a significant area of research in terms of why we're trying to understand, despite the fact that we've had significant improvements in screening, despite the fact that we have significant improvements in treatment, that Black women are still not seeming to benefit completely from these advancements that we've had. And so unfortunately, it's an area that we don't have all the answers to, but we are starting to understand that it's a much more complicated picture than we initially anticipated. And it's really a combination of underlying, you know, uh, some ancestral high-risk profiles that may be prevalent among uh, those of us of African descent. There might also be some social and environmental factors that are influencing how our genes respond to, you know, what we're going through in our day-to-day -day lives. And then also there are healthcare disparities, you know, differences in access to care and quality of care that are driving these differences in outcomes. So I think what we're moving away from is just sort of this siloed approach to, okay, let's fix screening, let's fix treatment let's fix survivorship to let's go across the continuum from etiology to survivorship. Let's identify all the barriers and areas that we're having issues and let's see if we can come up with a much more holistic picture to address all those, uh, those areas. And more importantly, let's make sure it's patient-centered. So let's make sure the patient themselves is involved in these discussions about how we think about these uh, issues that they're facing and how uh, we can help mitigate or reduce or hopefully eliminate the disparities that Black women are facing when it comes to breast cancer. Yeah, being patient-centered is, is something we hear a lot and putting it into practice is a lot different um, 
and I'm sure you've seen that, it, depending on where the patient is, uh, what their educational background is, what their resources are, what their transportation looks like, what their access looks like. I'm in South Carolina, so in the rural area, you know, a lot of times we'll give uh, patients a brochure, but not everyone's at the same level of comprehension, you know, as far as a brochure. Mm -hmm. Other times we'll send them to a website, and some of the areas that I practice in, they don't have internet access, or depending mm -hmm. on the age or the household makeup, may not have someone there that's tech savvy enough to access that information. So there's a lot of different layers, like you mentioned, to that. Um, one of the things that I thought about as well is the messaging that we give across um, the levels of care with providers. And sometimes when it comes to even breast cancer, there's been messaging that's changed uh, as far as what patients need to do. At one time, we talked a lot about self-breast exam, and then we moved to other things. And so I get young women, I work at a college health center for the most part, but I've worked in the public health department as well. And a lot of times women would come in and say to me, I don't know what to do, you know, when it comes to breast, can breast exam. I'm not really sure. What am I looking for, things like that. So um, can you speak a little bit about even the providers like myself who are many layers removed from the specialized area of care that you have? As this patient's coming in the door to me, whether she's a young woman or maybe a woman in her 40s that's a little concerned about what am I doing with my breasts? What's my relationship with my breasts supposed to be when it comes to that? What type of messaging would you say we need to have to try to make patients more aware of what they need to be doing before they get to that point where they need your level of care? So I think the first thing to emphasize is to know your breasts. Uh, you're going to be the person who knows your breasts the most, and I can meet you once and examine your breasts and then come up with sort of a treatment plan if necessary. But it's important to know your breasts. That way, when there are changes in your breasts, you'll be able to notice them at an earlier point. Um, the second thing, too, is to know your family history. Uh, depending on sort of the social cultural norms within your family, some families talk about cancer, some families don't. And so having that information can be empowering to you because if there is a persistent family history of cancer, so, you know, a history of cancer in your mother, in your uncles on your mother's side or your aunts on your mother's side and your grandmother and your great grandmother, there's a pattern. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that pattern has significant implications for you because it may suggest that there might be a mutation in your family that might be causing all of these people to get these cancers. And so knowing your family history empowers you to uh, seek uh, counsel in terms of how you can mitigate your risk moving forward. The third thing I would advocate is patients advocate for themselves. And so if you uh, either notice a breast complaint or you have some concerns about your family history and its implications on you, I recommend you meet with your primary care physician and have an honest discussion with them, either about the symptoms you're experiencing or your family history to try to understand what you can do to mitigate your risk. Um, the, the person who can make the most change in your health is yourself. And so it's really important that in any interaction that you have with the health system to advocate for yourself to the best of your ability. And that is the best thing that you can possibly do for yourself. Yeah, I love the part about, you know, the advocacy, because so many times that even in my particular, you know, uh, area where I'm at, I had a colleague that had something go wrong with her breast and saw a provider and was told by the provider, well, just give it a year and it'll probably be fine. But she did not feel comfortable with that, you know, but because of the environment she was in with other healthcare, you know, providers, and we were like, you need to go see someone else. And she did. And it was breast cancer, you know, and so, you know, thankfully her outcome was, was good because of her her advocating, but sometimes that's a difficult space, you know, for people to be in. And when you mentioned about family, not talking about cancer, so many of us don't know the family history. You know, we know that Aunt Sally died of something that we don't really talk about, or we don't really, you know, discuss those types of things. So being able to have those conversations definitely um, can make a difference. Um, when I went through training in the hospital in my bachelor's program, one of the areas I worked in was a, um, a care center that had breast cancer patients there. But in this particular patient, and this was some years ago, she was about 36 when she got a diagnosis of breast cancer and went home and didn't do anything, didn't tell anybody. You know, I, her family dynamic was such that she was a breadwinner, had small children. There were lots of complicated issues surrounding. So by the time we got to see her, it was at the point where there was, you know, pretty much nothing left to be done in that particular case. And so that, those type of outcomes, you know, make us think about where could we have intervened along that way, you know, and, and even in follow-up because no one contacted to follow up, you know, anything. And unfortunately, being African-American, being 
of, uh, you know, low income, all the things that could be stacked against her were, but that had a profound effect on me, you know, in, in speaking with her family even. So, you know, with patients and uh, with providers, because we've talked about patients, with providers, what are some things that you maybe have seen or can recommend as far as providers pushing past some of the biases that they may have? Because we know that all of some of the, the research has shown that it's not all social determinants of health, that some of it is coming from our side of the table. And so being able to not only speak to that, you know, as providers of color, but to speak to other providers, what kind of conversations have you had surrounding that, if any? So I think one of the uh, positive things that have come out of the last year is there are significant discussions uh, nationally in multiple hospitals about health disparities, social determinants of health, and also cultural competency. And I think that we really have a significant awareness across the medical field about how the patient or patient uh, physician, patient nurse, patient clinician relationship uh, really needs to undergo um, significant changes uh, sort of in terms of clinicians trying to meet patients where they are, like you said, and really trying to understand how they can communicate effectively to patients and really engage in a relationship where both parties feel like they're involved in the medical decision making. I agree with you, we still have some significant steps in terms of implicit bias and also in terms of um, gaps in our training about how we essentially talk to patients. We, we do get a lot of training in it, but I think it's something where uh, in terms of cultural and linguistic barriers, something that we, you know, we do have a, a course or we may have uh, some discussions about it, but we may not probably be getting as much training as we need. And I think it's something that the medical field has recognized over the past year. You know, the coronavirus pandemic put disparities right in our face. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't really any opportunity to look away or pretend as if it wasn't happening because every day you turn on the news, it was right there in your face. And so I think because of that, as a, a field, uh, the field of medicine is, is awake. Uh, and I think we recognize that there are significant changes that we need to make in terms of how we deliver healthcare and in terms of how we um, address populations of patients that have historically uh, faced barriers in accessing healthcare and receiving high quality care. Yes, and it's interesting that you mentioned COVID because that was one of the things that I wanted to ask about as well. You know, um, there's no doubt that it exposed a lot of cracks in the foundation um, that some of us knew were there, but they became much more apparent because of the stress that was put on the system uh, overall because of COVID. How, what kind of effect did this have for cancer patients? I mean, this is a population that's already facing a lot of challenges and here in comes COVID and it causes a big change in a lot of things with surgeries, being delayed, all of that. Can you speak to how that affected your area of practice, Dr. Open Jesse? So, you know, I don't think we'll know the true implications of COVID for a couple of years. I think that's when sort of everything will be revealed. But it did result in surgical delays where certain populations of patients, based on their, you know, tumor biology, we felt that we were, it was appropriate to delay their care uh, while the pandemic was going on. And uh, one of the um, sort of possible side effects of that is that among those populations of patients were people who already had difficulty accessing care, people who are already facing delays in their care. And so I think one of the things that we're going to have to do uh, moving forward as a surgical community is really pay attention to those populations of patients who were already having issues before COVID. And when I mean issues, I mean difficulty accessing high quality care, difficulty accessing care altogether, and how these delays might have impacted them after COVID. I think if we don't make an effort to find out what happened, uh, we won't know sort of what has happened and also how we can mitigate it. Now for black women in particular, you know, black women do face a lot of barriers in terms of accessing oncologic care. You know, black women are more likely to have a uh, face delays in surgical care. And as I mentioned earlier, have a uh, worse uh, mortality or worse outcomes compared to our white colleagues. And so for that particular population of patients, uh, the implications of COVID delays are something that I think we're also going to have to pay close attention to, because as I've mentioned, they face barriers before COVID. And so after COVID, we need to try to understand how, if any of those barriers continue to affect their post-COVID management and sort of things we can do to try to mitigate and reduce some of the um, unfortunate side effects of COVID. Right. And there's a fear that's already there in some uh, populations, you know, some ethnic groups, just because of the history that's happened, you know, um, in many different instances medically. And so that 
COVID has amplified that to a certain extent because some people now are afraid to go to the doctor or they're putting off care that they possibly could need to have. Um, we work in, in the clinic, even where we are, a lot of people push their, you know, uh, well woman exams. They push things because they feel like, you know, I'm not coming to the doctor's office for that. And although there was a time period when we did say we only want to, you know, see you if we have to, but trying to return to that, um, you know, it's definitely going to be a challenge to get those folks back in, you know, and it's important. Um, with the well woman visits that we have, we do have patients that, like I mentioned earlier, talk about breast um, issues or not really sure what to do. And what I've found as well with the messaging is, you know, patient to educate my patients, what I usually say to them about breast exam is I say, you know, if, if you close, if I asked you to close your eyes and I gave you a Ziploc bag and I said in this Ziploc bag, it's full of rice, but there's also a rubber ball, there's a gummy bear, there's a rock, and there's a marble. Even with your eye closed, eyes closed, you could easily identify those things because you know what rice feels like. So you, if you know what your breast feels like, don't worry about it. I don't know what I'm looking for. Do you know what it feels like? the um, things that aren't supposed to be there, you will recognize. And you don't have to know what they are. You just have to be able to get somebody to take a look at them, you know? So, um, you know, I think that, like you mentioned, being able to package information in a way that the patients can use um, and that they feel empowered, you know, um, that makes a, a big difference. Are there tools or things that you think about that you think you have in your area of practice that really empower your patients? Were you drawn to the particular facility you're at for any particular reason? Because I know a lot of times you, when you're specialized, you get to choose that particular place um, that feels right for you. Can you speak to a little bit about why you're at the James? So I was very impressed when I interviewed here at uh, the Ohio State University and uh, the Stephanie Spielman Breast Center is where I work. It's a standalone breast center. It's one of two in the country. And so essentially all the resources that you need to get your breast cancer care in one facility, which is always uh, really nice. Um, but I, I like the multidisciplinary approach. Um, and I also like the fact that the patient is viewed holistically because we have you know, geneticists, psychosocial support. Uh, we have a, um, a shop downstairs where you can get fitted for a bra after surgery. Um, we have all sorts of resources to sort of help the patient along their journey. And so I really like sort of the multidimensional approach, multidisciplinary approach in one place. <laughs> I'm a very simple woman. And so it's nice when things are sort of come together for me. And I like that component of it. And I just have felt very supported since I've been here. Um, my uh, division chief, Alan Sung, and then my department chair, uh, Tim Pollack, have all been very supportive about my area of research and disparities. Uh, and also one of my uh, primary mentors, uh, Dr. Carson, and, the, and these are people within the Department of Surgery, have been highly supportive of me in terms of you know, understanding disparities and also uh, focusing on a career in health equity. So, so far it's been a wonderful experience being here. That's wonderful. When you have all the tools that you need, it really makes it easier and it allows you to focus more on, you know, you don't have to worry about not having, uh, being in rural healthcare uh, and working in the health departments. There were times when we had to pack up things and go to the health department to go do and, you know, do an IUD insertion or something of that nature. And uh, sometimes you get there and they wouldn't have sterile gloves, you know, and if you didn't pack any, you'd have to run across to the doctor's office to get a pair those type of things. So definitely being able to focus on, uh, have that focus and be supported. I can see why that's an excellent space for you to be in. So uh, I always like to wrap up with uh, what's on the horizon. You know, there's so many uh, new things that are out there that are making uh, outcomes better for patients, which of course are things that uh, we would really like to know uh, about. Uh, I've had a couple of patients in my family, people in my family that have passed away uh, from breast cancer, one from triple negative breast cancer that we presented over several years. And so uh, have there been, are there any things that are on the horizon that are exciting to you uh, as you look into research opportunities that will produce better outcomes for every cancer patient and in particular for those of color? So there are a lot of clinical trials right now in terms of trying to understand uh, triple negative breast cancers and uh, trying to improve the way that we uh, work on them. So there's always going to be exciting research coming out uh, out of the multiple uh, clinical trial oncology groups. Um, in terms of a surgical perspective, I think one of the exciting things is that, you know, when, when we first started, we used to do all these really big surgeries on people, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of those surgeries sometimes were very deforming and had significant implications for a woman's body image. And one of the things that I've noticed over my training is we're doing less uh, big surgeries, so smaller surgeries, but having the same oncologic outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I also think as a field, we're moving more toward a combination of 
oncologic um, sort of safety with cosmetic, uh, good cosmetic outcomes, which I think is going to be wonderful for our patients in terms of, you know, I always uh, try to uh, tell the learners when I work with them is we want them to think that we were never here, <laughs> right? And, and that's sort of the goal that we try to, to do in terms of our, our surgical approach is that we're moving away from these uh, large aggressive surgeries to minimally invasive surgeries that still have good oncologic outcomes and good cosmetic outcomes. And I think in the long term, that's going to be uh, very useful. And also, I think uh, hopefully our patients will be more appreciative of that. Well, that is so wonderful. And it's good to know that because like you said, the body image is, a, is something that we see that's an issue for women from the beginning. Even in teenagers, I have four daughters. And so I'm really, really careful about the messaging about you know the body image. So being able to know that you want to have that uh, great outcome is definitely something I'm sure that your patients really appreciate. So I appreciate so much having a moment to talk with you this morning. Uh, it's just very good to know that um, there's so many good conversations that are going on and that there are professionals like yourself that are caring and competent and uh, moving things forward in not only the conversations, but also in practice. Um, we see so much in the news about, we, we only see in the news when things don't go right, you know, when somebody doesn't get the care they should, or when someone, uh, you know, because of implicit bias ends up getting, you know, a bad outcome. But it's good to know that there is work being done to advance the profession and to uh, make it a better experience for patients overall. So we appreciate you and we thank you so much for talking with us and we certainly um, wish you the best in advances for you and for your patients in your practice there at Ohio State. And thank you very much. All right, for great. Me. Have a great day. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye.